Thank you so much for the invitation. It's uh, great to be here, uh, and it's good that there uh, might be people out there as well. Hello to you. Uh, and um, I will talk about um, the messages uh, from, from, from our side on the state of the world and also what we can do about it. Uh, if you don't know it, WWF, we are a, a uh, worldwide organization, uh, more than 100 countries across the world, and um, we uh, act from global meetings to the local um, projects uh, with mud on our feet sometimes as well. And um, welcome to um, Anthropocene. Um, Anthropocene. It's as mentioned here by our Director General the, on Global, Marco Lambertini. We are entering a new era in Earth's history, the Anthropocene, an era in which humans rather than natural forces are the primary drivers of planetary change. But we can also redefine our relationship with our planet from a wasteful, unsustainable and predatory one to one where people and nature can coexist in harmony. So there is hope, and I'll get back to that. And this is also the vision of WWF. It's creating a future in which people and, harmony, uh, and, people and nature live in harmony. So people is, is central to us, of course. Um, <clears throat> so we as humans, we are acting, uh, making marks, geological marks for the future. And um, not only that, we've had five mass extinctions of, of, of um, of biodiversity on this planet up till now. We're now talking about we're in the sixth. And this one is created by humans. And the last mass extinction, when was that? 65 million years ago, when these guys uh, disappeared. So we might be in the sixth uh, mass extinction. And we try to um, tell um, how we see on the, on the state of the world. Uh, we do it in the Living Planet Report. Uh, it comes every second year. Um, next one is due next year, 2018. And there are two major uh, things that we're following, among, but there's a lot of things. And one is the biodiversity. This is what we call the Living Planet Index. And we've been following this since uh, 1970. And um, following vertebrates, 4,000 species in 14,000 populations. And uh, the decline in, among these animals has been 58% up to 2012. And since it's 2% down every year, we know that it's going to be around 67% in 2020. So in 40, 50 years, that is, we have lost two-thirds of these animals. Two-thirds are gone. Though you could say there are all lots of threats, of course, but the main threats to, uh, to the uh, wildlife and the biodiversity in the ecosystems, the habitat loss and degradation, there's a shrinking space. We talk about shrinking space for NGOs, non-governmental organizations across the world, but there's a shrinking space also for biodiversity and ecosystems. Of course, species over-exploitation, overfishing, there's pollution, we just talked about that. Um, um, you want just talked about that as well. Invasive species and diseases, and of course climate change, which is only starting and it's it's around the corner. So um, why worry? Is this does this matter? We all live in cities and, and there is some nature out there, but we are totally dependent as humans on the ecosystems and the services that, that they supply. Um, for example, if we save the climate, there's no use with that if we don't have the ecosystem services. And we can never uh, eradicate poverty without taking care of the ecosystems and the ecosystem services. And there are different kinds of, of um, uh, services that the ecosystems provide to us. You see them here, I won't get into the details, but they can be provisioning, like food and raw materials. They can be regulating, like for the climate and water regulations pollination, stuff like that. They can also be cultural, aesthetic values, relig religious, recreation, and so on. And they can also be um, supporting the basic one, photosynthesis, 
nutrients, cycling, and so on. And these are, as I say, central and total. We are totally dependent on the ecosystem and the, their services as, as uh, humanity. That is the one thing that we look into uh, uh, on the overall uh, side on, in the Living Planet Report. The other one is, is the human impact, the impact that we do as human beings. And um, you've seen these so-called hockey sticks, right? This is from 1750 to uh, up to now. And they all show the same uh, kind of, of development. Nothing happens for, for a couple of hundred years, and then suddenly the great acceleration in just about everything. These are just a few examples. There's a world population up there to the left. But then you have the carbon dioxide, fertilizer consumption, freshwater use, tropical forest loss, marine fish capture, transportation, name it. You can almost put anything up here, and you'll have the same kind of development in the, in the great acceleration in the last 50 to 100 years. And there has always been constraints. We heard about Chichen Itza, for example, they had constraints, but it was local. And we've seen local constraints in the last 200 years, but now they're becoming global. This is the other uh, uh, area that we, we follow very closely and what we call the, the global ecological footprint. Um, you see that, um, let's see, there's a pointer here. Yeah. This is the world biocapacity, and this is the total footprint that we as, as uh, humanity make on, on the planet Earth. And al already in the early 70s, we passed, there was a break even where we passed where it was not sustainable anymore. And since then, we have almost doubled. And today, as human beings, we live as, as if we had 1.6 planet Earths. And as we know, we only have one. And you can also see in this uh, diagram that, uh, that the, the biggest increase and the biggest portion of uh, the footprint is, if you can read it up here, it's carbon. So it is the, the, uh, the production and the use of, of fossil fuels in all different kinds of ways in energy production and so on. That is the big, biggest in increase. But you see it's also about cropland and fishing and, and uh, forest and, and grazing and so on. But the biggest is the fossil fuels. But this is not evenly distributed across the world, of course. But some countries here that, that uh, per capita has a, has a, a footprint that is six times bigger than what is available uh, per capita, the biocapacity on, on planet Earth. Six times bigger. And sadly, Sweden is among the top, or the worst, maybe I should say. We're among the top, the worst ten. And um, we are in the, in the same uh, category as you see, US, Canada, Australia, some, uh, some Gulf states uh, in, in the Middle East, uh, and so on. And if you look at it this way, at the consumption patterns, these circles represent, represent uh, the, the, uh, the footprint per capita in, in uh, respective country. So you see, uh, we're not far behind US. Um, it's US here, it's Sweden here, this is Tanzania. So Tanzania, along with many other uh, developing countries, uh, third world countries across the world, they have a very low footprint per capita. You can also see the different portions, the shares of different food, housing, transport, consumption and services and so on. They're not so different between US and Sweden and Germany, the shares, but if you look at Argentina, for example, it's more than 50% that is food. And what is that? Meat, that is meat. So food is, is, is a general and main uh, part of, of uh, our footprint, and meat is a big part of, of food when it comes to, to footprint. 
So what we, uh, just in short, uh, would like to um, to, to, uh, to, to mention as our key messages from this Living Planet report. Uh, there's a lot of more to read in that one, but these ones I would like to, to, um, to mention. First, firstly, preserve the planet's natural capital. We talked about the loss of natural habitats. We must preserve the natural habitat and the capital that we have. We actually must also have a more equitable resource governance because people are, are coming out of poverty, and that's great. A lot of people coming out of poverty all the time, but they are also coming into middle income and, and higher income uh, regions, uh, strata, and if we, they don't get into a more sustainable living and we can get down to a more sustainable living, this is not gonna work. So therefore we need a more equitable resource governance. We need to redirect financial flows we must stop subsidizing, for example, fossil fuel production. And we need to, to, to uh, redirect it to, to um, for example, renewable energy. We need to produce and consume, of course, within the planetary boundaries. You've heard the, that expression, planetary boundaries, and we need to do that within them. These two, um, energy and, and food, they are the two areas of, of monumental importance, I would say. Impact is really big, but if we can fix the production and consumption in a sustainable way, this is also a way we will have a positive effect. Cities were mentioned. We have worked a lot with cities from the Swedish WW office, and this is why. I don't know if you can read this, but it says here that 50% um, of global um, population is now living in cities and will be 70% in 2050. And it's already more than 70% of the global CO2 emissions from cities. Uh, and um, let's see, I, I can read it myself. <laughs> That's a large part of the GDP and so on. So cities are really important. Uh, and you could even say that the battle of sustainability of the future stands in the cities because the, the choices we make in the infrastructure of cities in the future, because three and a half billion people are moving into cities in the coming decades. Three and a half billion. There's enormous amount of, of infrastructure investments that will be made into cities. And that is really important how we develop that. And that's why we work with One Planet City Challenge 30 countries across the world. Umeå won, the, the, as we heard, the, the Swedish um, um, contest last year, and, and we were happy for that. So cities are really, really important. And are we then on a road to perdition or on to heaven? I don't know. But there is, of course, possibilities here for the cities. How much do I have? A couple, no, no, I, I'm not finished. <laughs> I have a couple of more minutes, right? Yes. Thank you. Um, just a couple of examples of what we think Sweden can do with this. Because if you look into different kinds of footprint calculators, and if you do everything right, everything right, you eat right, you transport yourself right, and so on, you will find out that you're still using in Sweden a couple of planet Earths. And why is that? Because the system, the system of, of the society. And these are maybe the most important things that we think that Sweden as a country can do. We need to put up consumption perspective, uh, uh, target consumption based emissions. We need to have targets for the consumption, not only for what we are emitting or doing here in Sweden, but also what we're doing overseas. This is really, really important. Half of our footprint comes from abroad. Production in China, for example, the coal production. We need a strategy for halving the meat consumption. It has doubled since the 70s. So as the first step, we need to half, half it again. We need to, to change the whole transport sector. That's one of the biggest footprints that we have in Sweden. So we need to phase out fossil fuel cars as soon as possible. Why don't already 2025? It is possible. And um, hmm, what about you and me? What can we do? 
Well, we've been working with these five Bs to the right. For you who speak Swedish and understand Swedish, you can look there. I tried to come up with some English, and I came up with this think with a C towards the end. So instead of Bilen, Bostaden, and Börsen, and Biffen, and Butiken, we have here transportation. How do you transport yourself? Do you take the bicycle, and how, what, what are you driving? Are you driving a car, and what kind of fuels? Housing, what kind of heating, and so on. How, are, how is your money invested? Pension money and other stuff like that. How are you eating? What are you eating? And what are you buying and are you buying? And when? Um, so let me conclude. <laughs> it may sound like, like there's a really depressed world we're living in, and it is in many ways, but there is hope. Um, if we act now, everything is possible. And sometimes, when you look back, it might have been even easier than you have thought. Look at, look at the price of solar power, for example. It has dramatically fallen. So once you take the decisions, it might not be so difficult. So we just need to come together and act. And then there is hope. I'm, I'm sure of that. <laughs>